All right, so I'm back with part two of the top loader rebuild video. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what torque locking sliders or torque locking synchronizer assemblies are. I think it's very important, especially with this particular build, because we're going to be using gears that have torque locking engagement teeth or torque locking clutch teeth. They've been around for a long time and you might see discussion of this on internet forums or when you're trying to purchase parts. Somebody may say something like, this has torque locking sliders, this has non-torque locking sliders. So let's get to that because we're going to be building a unit that's going to have some components that use these features. So I'll go over a little bit about that then some of the tips on going through this unit that I see are going to be problematic, some of the wear points we're going to discuss, and then try to get this unit together in part three. Let's do this. All right, so we can see from the engagement teeth of these gears, it's one of the first issues I caught right away with this transmission, that these engagement teeth are really worn. And so we need to get new gears because of the engagement teeth, both third gear, second gear, and the main drive or the input shaft are fairly worn. So we've got these new gears here, and you can see the beautiful pieces. These are actually made in Taiwan from a company called Sunup. Everybody sells them on the internet. Don't be fooled telling you they're made in the USA, they're made in Taiwan, but they're pretty good pieces. The downside of these gears is the engagement teeth or torque locking teeth. And this is what I wanted to go over today in this video is to sh explain what torque locking teeth are. So the first thing if you notice on these engagement teeth or clutch teeth of the gear, so I'm talking about these teeth right over here, is that they don't have straight flanks to them. They taper in towards the back side. And the old gears have a straight flank to them. It's hard to see because they're really chewed up at this point. You really can't tell anymore. Uh, when a gear is like this and it's fairly worn to this level, this is your holding power. A lot of people don't realize that it's not this gear here that is driving the output shaft. It's these teeth that are driving the output shaft of the transmission. So the ratio comes through this and there are some power, but the final drive is done through these 36 little teeth. So if you look at the slider, it has matching torque locking splines to it. The spline has a slight taper in towards the center of the slider. I always call it like a puzzle lock. So when it drives the gear, it is forced to ramp into the gear because of the ramp in the spline. Thus, it locks itself into the gear and it doesn't fall out. That is what torque locking is. There's pros and cons again to using these sliders and let me show you the reason that you should use them and when you should not use them. So if you have a gear, and a lot of the new gears that you see on eBay and in forums and people are talking about and for sale pretty much from a lot of people, when they have these torque locking clutch teeth on them and they have a taper towards the back side, you need to use a matching slider for that gear. Because if you don't, what's going to happen is you're going to just be riding on the edge of the tooth if you had a straight spline going through it on the slider. So it's very important that you match, that you always use a torque locking gear with a torque locking slider. That's important. When you use a gear such as this one here that does not have uh, locking teeth on it and just has a regular straight flank to it, it can over travel the slider. It can go past where it needs to go. And when that happens, it puts load on the shift fork. So here you have one side of a fork that looks in really good shape. And the other side of this fork, look how badly worn it is. This is worn because somebody used a torque locking slider on a gear that was non-torque locking and all the load was on the fork. In other words, the fork is in here like this and getting pulled against the, the slider. It's trying to pull itself into the gear and the fork, of course, is stationary and locked to the case. So what happens is it pulls into the gear like this and keeps on wearing the fork and wearing the, and sometimes it'll overheat the whole synchronizer assembly. I've seen this happen a lot, and this is one of the downfalls of using locking sliders. So you always see, I, I make for my Muncie four speeds, I make locking sliders and non-locking sliders. All right, so here I have a crude drawing. This is a standard gear with a standard slider, and you can see they have a straight spline on either side. Now, the gear has straight clutch teeth, the slider has a straight flank to it. The load is this way, the slider is going into the gear, and it's going that way as far as the, the rotation of the piece, okay? So now what happens is let's take a locking slider and I'll show you what it looks like. Here you have the gear 
as you could see, has a flank to it that tapers in. So the motion is this way, but the slider now is forced to pull itself down because of the torque. As this gear moves against the slider, it will kind of pull it into itself. So it's kind of like a puzzle lock. It's kind of shaped like this. And there's many different shapes. Sometimes they have a little pocket in them, but pretty much this is the idea. So when you have something like this, that's straight. If you have gears that don't have much of a torque load to them in terms of thrust load, like straight cut gears, these are fine, but when you have helical gears, most people use these now. Matter of fact, most of the Japanese transmissions, even in the 80s, kind of had setups like this. The new T5s have it. Everything's been having this for years. The problem on the older transmissions is that you really need to keep all these combinations of all these parts together for it to work properly. So this is a TKO 500 transmission. And what I wanted to show you on the TKO transmission, and a lot of Japanese and German transmissions, the torque locking engagement tooth of the gear has got the definite angle to, to it to, to pull it into the gear. But if you notice, besides the angle, this way, it's got a little raised section of the tooth to prevent the slider from over-traveling it and loading up the shift fork. So the particular slider will bump up against the tooth right over here at this stop and prevent overloading the shift fork. This is the proper way to design torque locking engagement teeth on gears and synchronizer assemblies. I just remembered, I got another transmission I want to show you. Uh, some of the torque locking. This is a, a BMW Z4 transmission. I, uh, Z, ZF box. Oh, a little heavy. So here I have a, a ZF6 speed from a BMW. And you can see it's got the back cut engagement teeth. This is a German transmission, and it has the stops right over here. These are the stops for the slider. Does the same thing, keeps the slider from overshooting the gear and overloading the shift fork. Now, what I have here is a gear from a T10 four speed. T10s were used in a lot of the GM products, so Chevrolet, a lot of Chevrolets and Pontiacs. And this is one that was in a Ford application. And I want to show you these engagement teeth or clutch teeth, they look really nice, right? They're nice and pointy and nice and sharp, but it was falling out of gear. And what a lot of people don't realize is that, again, because you're driving through these teeth, sometimes these teeth get distorted and they start to bend over like this. So I'll show you close up what that looks like. But this was falling out of gear. This gear can be still used with a locking slider, but what happens here is that the teeth start to distort and kind of pull over a little bit and it's just enough to cause it to fall out of gear. It'll start to round off over here and it'll just cause enough of a distortion of the teeth. Again, when you're looking at something like this, it looks really good, but then when you start getting very close and looking at the gear, you see the reason why it falls out of gear. And this is a good example of why you could use a torque locking slider with this and it would work out really well for you because there's still a lot of meat left on the gear. They just kind of distorted a little bit and bent a little bit and the torque locking slider will help that. But they look really good and a lot of times you look on the coast side, you'll start to see that some areas, some teeth aren't even being hit anymore. They're a little darker than others where there's less wear on them on the coast side and that's because they started to bend and distort. So because the driving one way pushes the tooth over this way a little bit, and then when you let off the gas and you go in the opposite direction, now you have teeth that aren't really parallel anymore to the slider's plane and they start to fall out of gear. Let me see if I can get a close-up shot of this so you can see better. All right, so if you look at these teeth, I gotta hold this very steady, you can see that they're distorted and they're twisted a little bit. See that one over here, this one here. You can see the way it's kind of pulled over, all right? And so the teeth looks nice and sharp, but you can see that the, the gear itself is fine, a nice shape, the teeth are nice and pointing, but you could see the way the wall of this or the, the flank of this engagement tooth is kind of pushed over to one side. All right, so now we got that out of the way, let's get back to that top load of four speed. 
if you look at the thrust surface of this gear here on the back side, you can see it was starting to go all up and get very hot and a little chewed up here. And it's pretty well messed up. But this is a common problem on top loaded gear sets. The third speed gear has very little clearance sometimes and we, used, we need to make some more clearance. And I'll show you what I'm going to be doing later on with that. But that has to be addressed, okay? Because what I do is when I build a unit, I'll take the new gear like this and I'll put it on main shaft like this. And then I'll take, let's see here, the synchronizer assembly and put it on. And when I put the snap ring on it, I noticed that this guy's snap ring was in really bad shape, like somebody ground it to fit. And if I try to even get the snap ring in there, it's very tight. And there's no end play at all. Nothing. So we need to address this. Typically we want to have around 15,000 send play, which will mean that the 15,000 send play of this gear will have 7,000 end play, 7,500 send play per side for oil clearance, which is perfect. So if I put this on and I put the snap ring in here, all the snap rings and the small parts kits for the top loaders are all the same. If I put this in here like this, you'll, get, you'll see what I'm talking about. So I put a snap ring in place on the 3-4 hub and there's no end play on the gear. It'll spin but with a lot of drag and once this thing heats up and there's no oil being able to get inside there, it's going to gall and burn up. There are different sized snap rings. Usually these snap rings, the smallest you can get is around 87 thousandths. So it again is okay to put it in here, but it's not going to work because again, it's, there's no end play this way. So I'm going to have to take at least 15 thousandths off the hub on the lathe and try to get that squared away better. So another area often overlooked on rebuilding top loaders is the key slots of the synchronizer hubs. If you look right here on these edges, you can see that they're opened up a little bit, right here on both sides. And that's because the key is working itself back and forth like this in it. So when you put it in here, it'll move more than it should. This can cause an indexing issue with the synchronizer where you can get a block out condition because if the key is allowed to move too much this way, in other words, if you can go too much like this, what will happen is this, the synchronizer ring will over index and it won't go into gear. So this is a common issue that happens often with these transmissions and can cause a shifting problem. So when a new hub, this kind of cures that the new hubs are, are heat treated better so we don't have this issue anymore with the new pieces. But this has been an issue with the keys. Also, keep in mind that this key on the 3-4 is shorter than the 1-2. The 1-2 key is longer and on the new keys they usually have a little indicator over here that it is uh, gotten the one two and there was a little notch cut out into it so you can see the difference in the size of the keys all right that's very important people mix them up all the time and then the unit has shifting problems so this was kind of neat because the transmission had the original federal usa bearings from the 1960s in it and believe it or not this bearing is in fairly good shape but the front bearing is wasted. Now, people ask me, how can you tell? You don't tell bearings by just spinning them and feeling for noise or anything like that. That really doesn't work because a lot of times you can have a new bearing and get dust in it and it will cause the same types of noises. So you could spin this and it feels really good, right? Sounds good, right? There's no play or anything like that. But if you look at the inner race, you could see some pitting. So let me take this bearing apart to show you. Basically what I do is I take, take the cage out and then put all the balls to one side and usually if you get a vice grip or something you could actually pull the bearing apart. Actually, so you got this vice grip now all clamped to this thing 
And that should give me enough room to get these balls out of here, huh? Okay. So you can clean this up here now. You could see the way the race was getting fretted here. You see that? So if you could see the race of this bearing here up close, you could see how it's pitted. Look at that. And this will only get worse over time. So this might have not even been noisy, but as you can see, we, we spun it before the bearing and it was nice and quiet, right? So spinning a bearing really doesn't mean much. You really have to look at the raceways and look for these types of pits. Also, because these gear sets are helical gear sets, you're going to notice that one side of the race, this side here, is pitted and the other side is not. So if we flip it around, that will give you a better idea. That's because the thrust load of the gear set is usually in one direction most of the time. So it's loading the bearing only on one side. One of the reasons why I don't really use max capacity bearings is because max capacity bearings, these are the bearings with more balls that everybody's obsessed with using. What will tend to happen is there's a lot more heat here generated with all the balls. So if you look at this cross section of the raceway like this over here, oftentimes what will happen is this wall height of the races is lower. So you get less thrust capacity with a bearing that has more balls in it because they have to kind of lower the, the height of the, of the raceway to fit a lot of balls in there. Or they call them filling slot bearings. And when you have a filling slot bearing, then you have an opening here on this corner right over here for the balls to go in there, which causes another issue in terms of strength. So this is what this looks like, this bearing on a cross section of it. And again, we could see that it was pretty pitted, pretty bad. And that's why these bearings have to be changed. But considering that this bearing is over 50 years old, it's not bad. All right, so now that we know that the bearing is bad and has to be changed, we want to inspect other things. As I said before, this, this shaft here was worn very badly and going through the case hardening. And uh, the case hardening is like an M&M candy. Hard on the outside and soft in the center. And so what typically happens is most of these case hardens, whether it's on a main shaft or it's on any type of shaft. Typically in manual transmissions in most, most car parts, they tend to have a kind of soft pliable inner core where it can flex a little bit, but this case hardening is usually only around 30 to 40 thousandths deep, and then it's soft metal. And the metal, the core of the alloy, like if this is 8620, will have a certain core hardness compared to 9310, which maybe have a, a higher core hardness than an M300 main shaft, which would even mean harder core hardness. So, the trick is to have that balance between a good hardness on the shaft and yet it still be flexible enough where it won't snap on the load. So I'll inspect the shift rails as well. I'll go over all the edges and make sure that they're smooth. If I find a little bit of a, a little bit of a rough spot, I'll go over with the flexible shaft and clean up the edges with uh, you know, a small disc. I have these little discs that I use and I'll go in there and clean them up, clean up all the rails and make sure they fit smooth in the case. I'll check the inside of the counter gear, make sure that nothing is pitted inside here. This looks very good. A lot of times you can have a perfectly good looking gear on the outside, and then on the inside, it'll be all chewed up, and sometimes that happens. Lack of oil, same thing, but this gear looks really good. We just got to clean everything up. On the shift forks, I inspect for excessive wear. These forks are in really nice shape. They fit, they look really good. They're always on top loaders. You're going to have this type of wear to them but it's not like it's really chewed up bad or overheated or starting to flake and metal come off of it. So these forks are in good shape and we're going to use the same forks in the gearbox. Now, one of the problems with these small parts kits is they come with nylon washers that they use and they started using these in newer gearboxes and a lot of people don't like them, but the old thrust washers seem to be in pretty good shape. So uh, we'll probably reuse the old washers. Now, when it comes to new synchronizer rings and all of that good stuff. A lot of times what I found is that these rings that they supply with the synchronizer assemblies really don't fit that well. They fit very high on the gear and they can cause a binding issue. So oftentimes I use my own rings which sit a little bit lower. This has probably got about a 60 or 70 thousands gap over here. And that's not really good. So usually my rings will sit a little bit lower and offer a little bit more clearance, and they actually lock up better. They, these are the same rings I use on the, on the TKO builds that I do. So this ring fits higher on the cone. It doesn't even lock up, all right? So 
there's nothing. This thing, you can put it new in the car and it would probably be very hard shifting. I can put pressure on this ring, it does nothing. Where this ring, the ones that we use, you put pressure on it and it immediately locks onto the gear. So night and day difference. This guy had provided me with a brand new main shaft and the main shaft has got some clearance issues that we're going to straighten out. This is a common problem again with these top loaders, especially with some of the new parts. But it's a nice looking piece. One thing I wanted to tell you, because this is obviously a new piece, a lot of times the top loader right here on this journal, where the needle bearings go, will be pitted just like that bearing I showed you, okay? And so you want to make sure that all this, this surface is nice and clean and doesn't have any pits in it, because that will cause alignment issues in the transmission and especially a lot of noise, which usually will quiet down a fourth gear because this is no longer spinning. It's locked directly to the input shaft in fourth. So check this area, check all your journals, make sure they're clean, they're not scored or anything. Don't have any blue marks on them, there's no scuffing anywhere, and they look nice and clean. Same thing goes for the matching part of this over here. You want to make sure that this journal inside here is nice and clean, there's no pitting of it, nothing scored in any way at all if we're going to use this gear again. But I'm not going to use this gear again because the engagement teeth are in fairly poor shape on it. And so since I have a third gear that's going to have a locking tooth on it, I need to have a slider that's going to work with both and that cause issues like I mentioned before where it can pull into gear too much. This is, it's a shame, it's a nice gear, but there were some issues with the front of it. Okay, the front area of the pilot was hammered. Uh, somebody kind of rounded it off. They probably were beating on it with a hammer, this way trying to get the bearings off of it, banged it up and then it wouldn't fit in the pilot bushing. So this is going to go in the garbage. I don't think it'll even make a good clutch alignment tool because this is probably all messed up. So that's it for part two. I hope you got something out of this video. Please hit me up in the comments below. All my information is again below in the comments. Uh, subscriber information, uh, contact information, buy me a coffee stuff. All that information is in this video it's description below. So thanks for watching. See you soon and please subscribe. We're going to hit 100,000 subscribers this year. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you again for watching. Thank you, everybody, for subscribing. Much appreciated.